Hi everyone, my name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the Executive Director of Afikta. I'm calling in from Beirut. Thank you so much for joining today's call. I'm really excited about it. Um, I'm going to do a brief introduction to, to Afikta and then we will get started without any further ado. It is my honor to welcome our guest, Isabella Hamad. Isabella's first novel, The Parisian, published in April 2019, is uh, being translated into 50 novels. She was awarded the 2019 Palestine Book Award, the 2020 Sue Kaufman Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters, a Betty Trask Award from the Society of Authors in the UK, and a Literary Fellowship from the Lannan Foundation. In 2019, she was a National Book Foundation 5 under 35 honoree. She is currently at work on her new novel set in London and Palestine. Isabella, welcome to Africa Conversations. Let's, let's get started by uh, sort of talking a little bit about, um, about your childhood. Um, I'm curious growing up, what, what literature really spoke to you and inspired you to be a writer? Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for all coming. I know we're at this stage, um, I don't want to mention the pandemic, but we're all kind of zoomed out. So I really appreciate um, people tuning into this. Um, um, I was just talking with friends the other day about the importance of escaping when you're a child, like um, when reading as a kid is very important for developing a sense of self outside of your, you know, the immediate confines of your, um, of your upbringing. Um, and I think that I was a really, um, you know, I was a really big reader as a kid. Um, I read a lot of, um, I read a lot of fantasy as a child, um, but I, I kind of got into really big books when I was sort of early teens, I would say. Um, and I did read a lot of English literature um, and kind of fat books and Russian literature. I think that was kind of when I started to get really nerdy into reading. Um, and when I started to think about being a writer, I think at quite a young age. Were you, were you one of those kids that was constantly writing stories and thinking about story when you read uh, as a child, were you reading really intentionally thinking about structure and character and that sort of stuff or just getting lost in the fiction? I think I was more getting lost, but you know, I was, I was surrounded by people who were really good storytellers. So like my family, um, I was the, kind of the quiet one in the family. My family are very loud and you know, there's a lot of like oral storytelling, I would say, a lot of anecdotes, people are very funny. <clears throat> Um, and yeah, sort of performative. So that I was sort of surrounded by that and I loved storytelling as an activity. Um, and I think that with the sort of more quiet being sort of shy and sensitive reading books, I don't think that I thought consciously about how to write a novel until much later, until I actually started to try and do one myself. Then I was like trying to work out how you do it, I think. When you started working on the, um, on the, the novel, was that the intent from the jump or was it, I just kind of want to write this story of my great grandfather and I'm going to start out with a sketch and then it turned, it went from a sketch to a broader thing. I mean, I actually, you know, I, I kind of wanted to write the book when I was a teenager. So it came very young. Um, I had heard stories about Mithat um, from a young age. And I remember sitting in the back of the car one um, holiday as my father was telling like a story about him for the umpteenth time thinking I'd like to write a novel about this. It was like a, you know, it was a, like a naive child's project. And I started interviewing my grandmother and writing down notes. And then I, you know, I was a teenager, I like set it aside. And, and then at a certain point, um, I guess it just sort of germinated and like it continued to live inside me. Um, and then when I left university, um, I just felt like I wanted to do it. So I think that, you know, I, I, I think I ended up doing what I initially thought I would do, which was write a long book about Midhat. I think in between there was lots of muddling and sort of like, oh, should I really do this? Or maybe I should write something else. When I spent that first year living in Palestine doing research for it, um, I definitely had doubts about um, about how practical it was. Was it was it going to be really difficult? You know, all these sorts of things. But I ultimately, the ultimate end product is actually quite similar to what I had sort of imagined as a sixteen year old. Yeah. So it, for those who are on the call or listening, um, the the book is the Parisian, um, and it is a semi biographical book that sort of traces the story of your great grandfather at the early part of the twentieth century from Palestine to France, um, to many other places, um, and then back to Palestine. 
Um, the idea on a sort of scale from zero to a hundred, um, hundred being I was married to the, the sort of blow by blow truth um, and zero saying I'm making all this stuff up. What was your target? Were you trying to, you know, not necessarily where you got, but what were you trying to do in terms of uh, how factual it was? You know, like, so Midhat raised my father partly, um, and a lot of the stories I did hear about him were him as an older man. So the main story um, that of him as a younger, as a young man was him going to France um, and the story of the letter and then what happened when he went back to Palestine. So I, I, it was pretty skeletal. I didn't have any documentation. I just had photographs. Um, so I was sort of filling in the gaps actually, really. Um, but with the material of a sort of um, uh, a sense of his character that I had absorbed from his children and my father's generation. Um, in terms of the percentage of what's true and what's not true, I think it becomes a little blurry. I never met him, so in fact, he was always kind of an imaginary character. I was kind of doing, you know, I was doing fan fiction on the basis of my family anecdotes, kind of, you know, I was sort of building building upon that. And I, I mean, it's sort of interesting to hear from my father and his siblings, like how accurate they feel it is or, but I suppose the question I was asking myself was how did he become this older man where he was known as Albarisi in Nablus, he was very eccentric, he's obsessed with his mouchoirs and his sort of silk clothes. How did he become that and what does that mean? And I saw my interpretation was that there was a lot of pain underneath it actually, this sort of funny performance had a lot of pathos and that was kind of what I, it ended up being a kind of like psychological map of his mind and his experiences as a young person in this period. So in many ways, it seems like the book is also a like a meditation on Palestine as much as on this sort of it's a it's a coming of age novel about your great grandfather and sort of a reverse coming of age for um, Palestine in a way. Um, in a, so I, I'm curious the to me there's this like there's this two these two tracks happening at the same time um, where sort of Palestine. Uh, doesn't emerge, the nation of Palestine doesn't emerge quite as, as um, some of the sort of actors are, are hoping and Midhat changes um, in, in the ways he does. Um, and he's called, he's called a Parisian and he's in Palestine and he's, there's this sort of duality around naming and other people naming things and claiming things. Was that irony discussed among your, maybe irony is not the right word, but that duality discussed among your family as well, or is that something that you're sort of uncovering and realizing, or was that part of the lore growing up? I mean, I think like growing up, I kind of had like 48 and the Nakba and what happened afterwards. And then I had kind of like funny stories of Midhat and they didn't necessarily, I didn't really know where they matched up. You know, I kind of need, was a process of discovering the ways in which, I suppose I, I suppose I kind of thought like, oh, maybe he was, completely at odds with the time or he wasn't political or politics didn't feature in his life. Obviously in the process of discovering, actually he was completely informed by the political situation. Um, I, I think that there's a lot in writing a book that is unconscious and that you don't, you know, in retrospect, you can sort of say, oh, I made this pattern to think about this. But I think that those, those, um, those relationships between uh, the development of an individual character in a novel and the, and the development of the nation or the idea of a nation are, um, that's quite a, it's almost, it's quite like a traditional actually model for a certain a kind of a novel, um, like, a, like a kind of 19th century realist novel or early 20th century realist novel. And I think maybe the, the irony or if there is an irony is that the idea of a nation state is imported from the West and it's imposed on the region um, by British and French forces who divide it up. So there's this negotiation about what Palestine is um, because of basically um, the actions of colonial powers. Um, so they, they debate whether they're gonna be, you know, are we Southern Syrians? You know, the whole region was greater Syria under the Ottomans. There's also sort of like murmurings of being attached to Egypt. So there's a sort of um, understanding of boundaries of the, of the self of the, of the nation or the state or, you know, but I, I guess that I wouldn't say it was a reverse coming of age because it's there's still a there's still a kind of 
congealing of, uh, of, a, of a national struggle that happens in this period, whether or not you have the exact place with, the, with this, you know, um, independence and self-rule. So I think those things are very much in flux and the idea of labels naming who has control over identifying what as what is very much obviously thematically kind of baked into the, into the book and into my thinking around it. I want to talk a little bit about the sort of the first and second part of the book, focusing on his time in, in Montpellier and then in, in, in Paris later. Um, how did you go about doing research for those, those sections of the book? Um, his roommates in Paris, are these characters that you sort of fabricated or can you talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, the roommates in Paris, I, you know, it was kind of based on Al Fatat, this sort of this, um, di this diaspora um, group of um, basically exiles from greater Syria who took up residence in Paris during this period and were sort of talking about what they were going to do post Ottoman, how they were going to, you know, um, and, and one of them, um, a, a man called Aouni Abdel Hadi became actually part of uh, Mir Faisal's um, cohort when he attended the Versailles um, uh, conference. So I kind of was sort of basing on that. I was sort of slotting Mithat into that milieu, but he, um, which, which is a milieu that he was also part of in Nablus, you know, kind of tangentially. Um, so yeah, for me, fairly fabricated, um, you know, on the, but on the base, on this kind of skeleton of history, I suppose. Um, I think that I, I don't know if this is a how all novelists who work with historical facts work, but I, I, I tried not to worry too much about um, how much I stuck to the historical record. And then in retrospect, sometimes I would patch things up or make sure things were accurate. But largely I would just read and read and read and then, and then see what came out from my, from my mind sort of thing. So, um, so there was a fair amount of invention. In the Montpellier section, um, I really didn't have very much to go on. I mean, I did like, I emailed the university and was like, do you have a record of, you know, but, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, it was fairly invented. And actually, I didn't actually go to Montpellier until after I'd finished the book. So I had a quite a weird experience, um, having spent a lot of time looking at images of the university in the town of like seeing this place that had been, you know, in my imagination kind of brought to life. It was quite weird, yeah. I, I heard a, uh, an interview with, I, I, I think, your, one of your professors at NYU, where he was saying that you had submitted a sort of a first draft of um, what later became the book, and it contained one section of it. Uh, am I getting that right? And then that sort of served as a thing that went to an agent and sort of created mm -hmm. for yeah. the first draft. What yeah. section was it? It was the first section until the middle of part, or, or like the beginning of part two. So, so yeah. Okay, interesting. Um, okay, I want to talk about the third section and talk about Nablus. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how that really serves as a, you know, a central character. Um, you did not grow up in Nablus. Um, how much, how did you try to learn what that city is not even today, but a hundred years ago? Um, what was the process like of, uh, in doing that? Um, I, I talked to a lot of elderly people, spent a lot of time with elderly people. <laughs> um, my grandmother in particular has a very, um, she's a very uh, proud member of CEA and she's got a very strong memory for detail. Um, and she was a kind of great source um, of information, of stories, of, de of really of details, you know, specific details. Um, and uh, that was that, that. That was my main source, really. I mean, I also spent time with. I mean, I spent time in Nablus, obviously. I stayed there with my relatives and um, for quite a long period. Um, and would go back and um, also spend time with um, architects. I found kind of the architecture of the of the town is so important. I think architecture in Palestine in general is very important and very interesting. Um, and something I, I think I obsessed over. So houses and the structure of houses is very important in the book and in my imagining of spaces. Um, but those were those were the main things. There are also some very good memoirs by a few uh, writers about Nablus in particular, um, which I which I read and sought out in like American libraries. Any, any recommendations? 
Um, there's, um, uh, well, it's Ihsan and Nimr, who wrote a bit in a kind of four volume history book about Nablus, which actually the first volume is the only one that's like available in the West. So I, I had, you know, yeah. but I, I finally got um, volume three in Bitter's Eight Library. And <laughs> I mean, these things, they result in maybe like a sentence of detail, but I think you become obsessive, like a kind of detective. You want to have all the, all the pieces in place. There's also um, uh, Akram Zaitar, there's, um, um, Aoun Abdel Hadi's memoirs. Um, there's another one whose name's on top of my tongue, but yeah, there are, there are quite a few of them. You know, it's so funny in preparation for this. Um, I real I came across the fact that you know, um, or I was surprised by the fact that there was a, this huge earthquake in 1927 that really changed the topography of the city. And it's amazing. I never like we don't get taught that stuff. <laughs> like I, at least I, I never got taught that. Was Nablus one, was it, was it a character in the stories that you grew up with? And, you know, like these, this oral tradition in your family telling stories about your great grandfather, was Nablus also a character there? Or did you sort of say, okay, this needs to be a central character in my book, even though it was absent in the stories that we traded in the family? Oh, it's, I, mm, I think now it's hard to, it's hard to tell the truth. I can't remember. I think, I think my grandmother is so invested and sort of, proud of being from Nablus, that I think Nablus was a feature, you know, um, but I probably, I couldn't really invest it with, uh, with, um, with lived experience until I spent time there. So, so it's a mixture of the two, I think. Um, but, but now it's a very special town. It has a kind of magic air. Um, and, uh, and it, it was very compelling to me and to write about it. I think it's sort of a, it was so important during the Ottoman period. It was so economically important and politically important. Um, and yet there, there isn't that much written about it. You know, there are books, but they're but not like Jerusalem or, you know, um, so it, it sort of, it called out to be, uh, to be written about, I suppose. That, that's great. Um, again, I want to talk about um, the, the book serving not only as sort of a, a, a a biography of sorts, and in some ways, sort of a revelatory political history. We're going to talk about Faisal in a second, but it also serves as a love story. Um, was that intentional also going into it? Um, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Um, Midhant was a lover of women in general, but um, his relationship with Fatima, with um, my great grandmother, um, was also quite kind of fabled in the family. Um, so, so very much, I was I was thinking about what it meant that he was so preoccupied with um, with his emotional life at this period. In this period, um, very much important piece of the of the picture. How is? I feel like that's like particularly personal. How, how was the response from peripheral family and friends? I think that, you know, the, the stories are told, you know, they, they, they're not kind of like uh, hidden stories. They're sort of like, you know, it's not very really well much. aired laundry. Very well. Yeah, I know. So like, I mean, to, to details, details, I didn't, you know, I didn't put all the details, but uh, I don't think, um, I don't think there was much concern about that. I had a lovely experience actually in Amman just before the pandemic, I mean actually as the pandemic was starting um, and all these people came up to me who who had all these other stories about them which I didn't know, <laughs> you know, so I kind of like uh, the, the, was kind of far and wide, Mithat and Fatima, um, yeah. their, their romantic life, yeah. It's a sequel that the, <laughs> they're looking for, the Parisian bigger and better. Um, okay, I want to talk, uh, I was telling you before the call um, that I've recently become obsessed with learning about Faisal as a, as a character. Um, what did you learn about that process, uh, about researching this moment um, in time and you know, uh, what was going on in Palestine and in uh, what was supposed to be the kingdom of Syria? What did you learn about that and why were you motivated to sort of make sure that there's a big part of the, uh, of the book? I mean, I found this fascinating and it it was interesting also that the kind of first stirrings of this were happening in Paris, you know, that he was coming to Paris. Sure. And all those, all those, uh, um, what were they called? There was a specific word for them. Um, they're like consultations. It was like yeah. piece by, piece by a consultation. What was the word? There's a word I'm, I'm missing. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, and all these kind of audiences they would have and um, the ways in which Faisal was invited, but then wasn't pro properly going to be given an audience. And there were all these sort of um, 
toings and froings. And I guess, I guess, you know, historically it was of interest uh, quite apart from the characters involved, simply because I was interested in um, the uh, the uh, McMahon Hussein correspondence and and how that um, contradicted other agreements like the Balfour, the Balfour but also yeah. um, the Weizmann agreement all these things that were kind of these machinations going on with the French exactly um, and wh who was promising what to who I kind of wanted to look at before things were a foregone conclusion what were the what was going on you know basically and a lot of it does depend on character and and um, there were certain particularly memoirs I think are very interesting or or, or diaries um, to get a picture of, of the day-to-day -day life. And there were some amazing descriptions of Faisal as a person. Um, and uh, there was, I can't remember, I think it was Anatole France, really loved him and kind of like took him to the baths. And I mean, there's sort of like weird interactions with Faisal in Paris that yeah. were also very like provocative and interesting to write about. There were also interesting things in um, about um, Lawrence, you know, kind of the, the problem of Lawrence um, in Paris at that time, which also was very interesting to me, although I didn't really want to write about Lawrence. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, whole, the whole face of clan, like his brother and his father, it, they're so, it's so fascinating, that whole period. Um, you mentioned, you sort of allude to um, this idea of the, the class dynamics in, in Paris. So your great-grandfather was, he wasn't an, an elite, but he was definitely further up the economic spectrum. Um, and so I'm curious about your position also in trying to unpack these things, given also your, your perspective, and your sort of um, economic economic perspective and knowing that you know you are you have the privilege like me of having traveled abroad and studied abroad and so you also have limitations of your own perspective how did you feel like you um what sort of responsibility did you have to try to tell that story and keep your own your own sort of perspective in check i mean i was interested in class very much um midhat was middle class um and class in nablus is quite alive, you know, kind of class dynamics. And I was interested in the fact that um, the main obstacle to his marriage, the Fatima, was his class standing, that he wasn't, um, he wasn't kind of upper class enough. And so his income was very important. And um, then what happens with the, with the family business, all these things are sort of like economic aspect of personal life was very interesting to me. Um, <clears throat> And then in addition to that, the fact that in the 1930s, the people who, you know, after you have this sort of, you know, you kind of have the leadership of the, of the national struggle are all elites um, in Nablus and in Jerusalem mainly. Um, and then you have the, basically they've stalled, there's infighting, you have the different family alliances, it's kind of getting nowhere. Meanwhile, the, the, the Zionists are making a lot of progress. Um, uh, you know, in getting favors from the British and so on. Um, and then it's the fellahin, it's actually the farming uh, classes who basically take control and, um, and mobilize in, a, in an amazing and very, a way that really surprises the British, takes them off guard, um, mobilize a, an uprising against um, the British occupation and, uh, and the Zionists. So I think that, that that dynamic was also interesting to me. There's a kind of developing class consciousness within Palestinian society. Obviously my character is a middle class though. So I, I guess I, I was trying to look at that from the edges so, so that they feature, even in the first part, you know, you have like servant classes. There's a sort of like, I kind of wanted the middle class characters to be haunted by um, the working classes. There's a sort of haunting that goes on. And then there's a sort of important moment when um, the uh, the maid that Midhat grows up with um, appears in his new home. So there's a sort of feeling of them beyond the edges, and then they take over um, in in the struggle. So it was very very important. I mean, it continues to be important. I think that particularly in that moment, um, it became that the burden of the struggle was on the shoulders of the fellahin, and then suddenly their clothing became very symbolic. Suddenly you had this kind of valuing of the kofiya or you know things that previously the um, the uh, you know the middle classes or the or the city dwellers wouldn't wear, and then as a as a factor in trying to um, protect those who were fighting, everybody wore the kofiya in in Nablus. Everybody was wearing the kofiya. So actually, um, I think it was Al Hash Hassan um, 
from the Hamad family refused to remove his tarbush. So he wore his kufiya on the tarbush, which probably looked ridiculous, but that this kind of like negotiation of the measure will go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's perfect. Your grand, your great grandfather's name is perfect as as sort of like this this function. It's a perfect sort of like vehicle to to make that point, right? It's a mm. Turkish name. His 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 birth name is a Turkish name. He's his nickname is a European name, and he himself is trying to figure out negotiate this idea of are we Syrian? Are we Palestinian? Are we British? Are we Ottoman? Like what exactly are we? This idea of, um, of reclaiming names and putting kafiyas on top of tarbush is, uh, is perfect. Um, okay, I want to talk a little bit. We have great questions in the chat, so I want to try to get to the Q&A as fast as possible. But I'd love to hear a little bit about what you're working on now. I highly recommend people check out also um, some of your older work, including the short story. But um, Tell us what you're working on now. What a, I know that you're working on a new novel, um, but tell us a little about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm inching towards the finish line. I said I'd be finished last year, but I'm, I, th I don't know if they, life gets in the way or you get slower. 2020 but, um, doesn't count, don't worry. I know, I know, but I, I said I'd be done, but anyway, um, I'm in the last chapter. It's a, it's a shorter novel, um, it's about half the length, hopefully, um, and it's modern day, it was, it was set in 2017, and it's about three women, and it's largely about theatre, actually, it's about theatre in Palestine, um, so I've been working on that since 2017. Um, I was about so. to ask you, have you done theatre? Were you drawn to the stage when you were a kid? Um, uh, peripherally, I was interested in arts generally, and yeah, I like acted in a few plays. It was never my my love. I think books were my love, but um, but uh, I think it is interesting to me. And I mean, I don't feel like I can talk very um, articulately about it because I'm kind of submerged in it. But I think it's an interesting. It's provided me with an interesting metaphor, an interesting way in to think about um, the situ kind of modern day situation and. Um, occupation of space and bodies in space and so on and performance and power so um it's been it's been fun yeah because I've, I've listened to a lot of authors do readings um mm -hmm. and i gotta say I'll, I'll put you up with the best of them you're uh you are oh. a very good reader um okay i want to get to the chat if we still have time at the end i have tons more questions but as a transition, um, we'll do our quick Q&A. Um, if you have any more questions, we already have about 10 questions in the chat, but if there are any extras, please type them in. Um, and we're gonna ask everybody to ask short questions uh, when we get to them. Okay. What are you reading or watching right now? Um, I'm between books, but I just started a book called Divorcing by Susan Torps and uh... I'm reading my student, I'm teaching at the moment, so I'm reading student work as well. Okay. Oh, and I'm also reading a book about theater actually by um, a kind of collection of essays by a guy called Ayad Hassami called um, um, Defeated by Hope or something like that. I can't remember the title, but yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, I suspect this might be your great grandfather, but if <laughs> it's not, um, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Well, it would definitely be somebody historical, like in ancient times, I think, like maybe a pharaoh or Ibn Battuta would be quite fun, I think. Maybe. Yeah, He's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. Depending, like put on good shoes for Ibn Battuta. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, um, what do people most misunderstand about your work? I don't know, I feel like, I don't feel like there's a common misconception that I'm battling with. I also feel like, if there is, it's probably my fault. I think that, um, but also everyone's entitled to their opinion, their interpretation. So I don't, I don't feel misunderstood. I think you know, you just put things in the world and you hope they land with someone. When for a project that you had been sort of thinking about and mulling around since you were a teenager, I'm curious, what were you surprised by? What did you sort of misunderstand about the pro the process of writing a book, or misunderstand even about the book itself? Like you finished it and you're like, whoa. I did not expect this or that, or I didn't expect this, I would have this reaction. What were you sort of surprised by? I don't think I knew it would take me so long, but that's because I was I was naive. I didn't know how long it took to write a book or, you know, it mm. took me five years or something. And I was like, I'll do it in a year, but you know, it's 21. Um, I, I think that, um, 
there was so much I discovered along the way that I couldn't have anticipated. Um, and um, I don't know, I didn't, maybe I didn't, I didn't, I couldn't predict the journey it took me on. I mean, it became like a very important thing for me to, to be honest with you, like the most valuable responses. I mean, obviously it's lovely when anybody reads it and likes it, but the ones that really make, really move me are elderly Nabulsis, you know, when that, that to me, or I mean, elderly Palestinians in general, but there's a kind of, uh, given that those are the people who gave me so much that I that allowed me to write it for it to feel like a gift back to them is very um has taken me by surprise and has been very maybe one of the more, most valuable um uh results I think personally that's interesting to me um because it when I when I was preparing for this I figured that the audience would most likely been a western audience right and and sort of a way to tell the, the Western audience, like to sneak in a little history, right? And be like, you don't know any of this. You don't know anything about these double dealings. You've never heard of Faisal. You've never thought about this stuff. You've never heard about the struggle. I'm gonna sneak this into a beautifully written novel. Mm. Um, but that's surprising to me that the, the audience that you're sort of cherishing the most is sort of the, the Nabulsi audience. That's interesting. I mean, I feel like uh, it's obviously, obviously it's great if people learn who don't know anything about Palestine or this provokes interest in Palestine or in Palestinian history. That's amazing and wonderful. And I'm very happy to participate in that kind of like general educating that needs to happen. But I also feel that there's a limit to how much a, a single novel can do. So there's something more, um, the, the kind of uh, people who have a stronger emotional response, I think it somehow feels more, I don't know, but maybe that feels more valuable to me, but maybe that's just a personal. Um, cool. Yeah. Okay, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? And then we're gonna go to the Q and A. Okay, um, I'll give the most common answer, but everyone says Edward Said, but it's true. <laughs> it's, it's good, even, better. The, even the 10th things. time, it's an it's a acceptable answer. Um, okay, great. So. This is a uh, tons of questions in the chat. I please compel everybody ask your question uh, succinctly um, and please make sure it's a question and not a comment. So we're going to start out with, um, we are going to start out with Marianne. Okay, um, what I was uh, wondering is uh, your novel has a lot of characteristics of a 19th century realist uh, novel. You also mentioned that, I think, in your uh, uh, comment. But to what extent do you think your novel innovates that genre? Um, you know, I think that in the realist novel, you know what Roland Barthes calls the reality effect, where you have incidental details that contribute to your commitment to the reality of the, of the fiction as a, as a reader. I feel like for this case, because the subject matter is a Palestinian and I'm writing about Palestine before 1948, um, and will I or won't I, I'm interacting with the slogan, a people, um, a land without a people for a people without a land. To write something with the reality effect has a kind of political valency, I would say. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that that's maybe um, um, one way in which I think that it's maybe innovates that. Um, mm -hmm. In, in the same vein, perhaps you'd say, um, what, it, what does it mean to write something that's kind of a buildings roman with an Arab protagonist? You know, a buildings roman usually has got a kind of um, Western European uh, male protagonist who sort of sets out to make himself in the world. What does it mean if that protagonist is Arab? What does he confront? You know, what, yeah. where, what are the obstacles that he can't really assert himself on a blank canvas. He's actually already, as everyone is, tangled up in a web of um, power structures and um, circumstances, political, economic, and so on. So I guess that I was, I was engaging with the form in certain ways. And then to be totally honest, also, you know, I had grown up reading a lot of 19th century fiction. There are ways in which I, um, I uh, was influenced by, um, uh, um, uh, formerly by novels with lots of characters. You know, I liked those novels that had a lot of characters. Yeah, and yeah you can notice that. <laughs> um, Leif, are you there? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, really great to, to kind of be listening to this. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned Edward Said because uh, you may have seen that there's a new biography 
uh, coming out soon and one of the excerpts being shared uh, about the biography describes him being quite dismissive about the potential role of literature to change the world, uh, which I think is a really interesting debate and you kind of touched on it slightly as well in terms of who kind of you value, kind of your, your work being uh, appreciated by the most. Um, would you mind kind of expanding on that? You know, do you, do you disagree with our hero? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's a really interesting question. I think that um, um, I won't deny that when I started writing, I had quite romantic ideas about what literature can do, you know. Um, but I think that um, I do, I, I don't want to be too cynical though. I do believe in the um, efficacy of many, many kinds of narrative, many, many kinds of artistic production as a whole, as a kind of wave to affect change. Um, but, it, but it's not a single work of art to do anything in particular. And I think putting pressure on, a, on the artwork, on a single artwork to do that kind of political work that really should be the work of human rights activists and um, politicians and policy um, activists, that will, it, it, it can be anathema to making good art as well. You know, I think we have to be careful. Um, we'll end up making, I think that, um, you know, um, Brecht, uh, <laughs> had the effect of producing quite a lot of bad art. Like, but I, but I still, I still believe on a human level, um, you can't have good activism without kind of good literature and vice versa. I think that they're they're sort of intertwined. But I think we sometimes need to reframe the way we think about individual works of art and the kinds of the kinds of jobs they can do. I think, if that makes sense. Great, thank you, Liz. Um, Nasser, you're up next. Uh, thank you, Isabella, for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I just actually asked a question that I had sort of like asked a couple of months ago after I read your novel. I said I was elated about your novel. I actually think it's one of the most beautiful novels that I read in the last 10 years. Um, but I couldn't help but see in it sort of like a Bildungsroman type of novel and I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on whether you were influenced by specifically two individuals Dostoevsky and Proust. <laughs> um, yeah I mean I would say Wolf more than Proust although I think that they they sometimes operate in a similar kind of um, similar kind of way when they when they're writing about memory um, but um, but I haven't read all of Proust. I don't feel like I can claim to be influenced by Proust, though I've read, I've read the first one. Um, Dostoevsky, um, I um, discovered later, actually. So I, I feel like I, I read Tolstoy when I was young rather than Dostoevsky. Um, but um, I mean, I read him later on. And I think that in terms of thinking about moral dilemmas facing the individual um, and also Christianity. You know, there's a sort of like, um, I think that there's even in a weird way, there's a kind of redemptive redemption narrative that I uh, ended up um, uh, writing along, which I think is kind of influenced by those sorts of novels. Great. I, I have to say, I love it that we have past conversation guests who attended calls and past presenters who attend calls. So it's really a beautiful community to see that. Gabriel, you're up next. Uh, hello. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. And hi, Isabella. Uh, I, I even brought my copy of the book along. I wish you could reach through the screen and sign it. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed your book. And in fact, when I when I read it, I just finished um, doing a PhD in Palestine studies and I was looking at English travelers in Palestine in the Ottoman period and uh, the early 20th century. And it seemed to me that you really kind of captured that Orientalist tone um, and the way you're thinking not only about the Palestinian characters, but also the kind of British officials and the French priest, etc. So I was wondering what kind of research you did um, to kind of get into that mindset and the kind of Orientalist and colonialist mindset of those uh, European characters in your novel. Yeah, I kind of, um, the priest character is, the, is I think really what you're talking about is the sort of orientalizing mm -hmm. eye in the Middle East. Um, the, the British characters only really have cameos and they're slightly cartoonish, although I did find that 
um, in the in the research I did into the British um, colonial presence there, they were kind of cartoonish. You know, I read that there was, uh, he was called uh, Sergeant Duff, which is where the word to duff someone on the head comes from. He was in Palestine and his, he just, it's such a cartoon, I feel like a kind of uh, awful um, Englishman. <laughs> but um, uh, in terms of the priest, there was a real French priest who I based um, the character on, who wrote a book about Nablus. So that was like the primary, um, uh, source of information for that character in particular. Um, and I also spent some time in the British war archives and found some, um, I was particularly intrigued by uh, some secret intelligence documents about characters in, in all of, uh, I mean, they were, it, was called, it was a document called Personalities of Southern Syria, which is Palestine. Um, and there were lots of people in Nablus and the kind of language they used to describe them. Um, you know, I kind of took a slow through on that. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gabriel. Um, Joshua, you're up next. Uh, I just wanted to say this, love the entire novel, but particularly the Nablus section, it was like being back uh, in Ramallah and Nablus. And I was just wondering how on the one hand you handled the socio-political realities that you're sketching without telegraphing the Nakba. I thought you did a really good job of showing the options that were on the table, the different movements. And I was just wondering as a writer, how do you balance knowing what's coming on the one hand, but also inhabiting the historical world that your characters are in, um, you know, as more of a historian, how do you do this as a novelist? I mean, I guess that was the, in a way that was the project that was, it was how to imaginatively inhabit a period before the future had been determined. What does it mean to be a young person in this period thinking about the future, how to reclaim a feeling of futurity and a feeling of possibility. But it's always, it, you always have a double vision because you also, there's a, the, the, um, the historical fact of the Nakba is works like a dramatic irony, at least for the, you know, for the reader. So I think there are maybe a little moments where like I couldn't resist like maybe su tiny suggestions of it, or there's like a image of a wall or, you know, this kind of like tiny little um, symbolic fingers pointing. But I, I broadly, I, I guess, yeah, the idea was to write about it before, you know, um, um, so um, yeah, that's the, the imaginative leap, I guess. Great question, Joshua. Thank you so much. Um, John, you're up. Hi, Isabella. Uh, I loved your novel. As a slow reader, within seven days, I read it. So it was real good to me. I have a question about the story itself. I don't hope it's a spoiler for, for the guys who didn't uh, read it. Um, Mirat com comes back from Europe, and everybody thinks he had a doctor's education. But why, why isn't in the story uh, uh, a line that people are confronting him with, why aren't you going to work in the hospital or when he loses his firm, when, he, when there was the fire? I, I was curious about it. Is, is it the fiction? Is it the fact? Um, I, I, I believe maybe um, um, uh, the people from the Blues would be glad to, be, to have a European educated doctor in the house. So I was wondered by that. It, it keeps nagging in my uh, back of the head. Yeah, Midhat never, so the real Midhat never actually confessed that he hadn't finished his medical degree. He said that when, uh, I was told that when people said, where is your certificate? He said, oh, on the ship, I was playing with it over the water and it fell in. You know, <laughs> like, um, and then I actually, in this event in Amman last March, um, someone came up to me and said, I was at the party where we celebrated Mithat's medical certificate. And I thought, oh my God, did he actually, is that, a, you know, if I got it wrong? And she said that um, we were at the party and it was framed on the wall and he leaned over to me and said, so she was even a little girl and said, do you, uh, do you know what that is? Do you speak French? And she said, no. He said, that's a certificate for dancing. <laughs> at a party to celebrate. <laughs> so it was like very in keeping. Um, so, I mean, I guess in this case, it was like getting a, you know, it was just getting a good degree, um, but the needs of the family business were such that he was going to take over the family business and there wasn't that much question about it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, that was the, I guess I tried to write to, to the reality as much as possible. Great. Um, Zunaida, I think that's the right pronunciation. You're up next. Hi. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you. 
Um, Isabella, your book has all the excitement of my favorite historical um, fiction authors, uh, Orhan Pamuk, uh, Susan Abul Hawa, Khalid Husseini, just to name a few. And yet it has that classical feel of the of the almost um, 19th century Hardy, Dickinson feel. So I just wanted to know from you, was that deliberate, um, you know, that, that type of fusion, was it deliberate on your part or was it something that happened just because of the literature that you studied and read? I find it, you know, very interesting and quite a distinguishing um, feature from your from your book. Yeah, I think that a little bit. Thank you for the question. I think that I sort of touched on it a little bit that I think it's a mixture of the two. That there's always an element of I think in the first novel that's uncon or like uncontrolled or unconscious because of what you happen to read as a kid. Um, but I did. I mean, I, it wasn't the only thing I read as a child in 19th century books. But I do think that there was something in the impulse to write a a kind of a 19th century buildings roman um, before the Nakba, that that as a project had a kind of sort of pro was provocative to me in, in its political implications. Um, so it was, it was a combination of the two. Thanks so much. As a tag to that, um, do you feel like you were also, as you were publishing this, sort of um, trying to push the boundaries of what you think Arab, you know, uh, novels about the Arab world or of the Arab world could be about? Was there any sort of deliberate deliberate move to do that? I think, well, I mean, the title, I think, I mean, especially in yeah, America. Yeah, it's very clear, a novel is very clearly written on that. Yeah, but also it being the Parisian, you know, like sure. not the Palestinian. Like I think that there's a, you know, there is an appetite in um, the Western literary market for news of the world, like that a novel novel about from other regions is going to present you with news or be kind of have an anthropological, political sort of um, uh, be representative or present an example. And I think that those were ideas that um, were in my mind in the writing. So that, that those are things that Mithat himself is confronting when he goes to France and he's taken as an example of a, of a Muslim Arab um, and, and the kind of, fighting against the boxes people put you in. I suppose that's sort of in there. Um, so I was in a way, I was thinking about that to a degree um, and trying to play with it, I suppose. Great, uh, Nessam, you're up next. Hi, um, I think my question relates to your last answer. So it was um, related to the response from UK publishing houses to a book about Palestine. What was the response and how easy was it to publish? Well, in the UK, it kind of was sent directly to someone who accepted it and it had a, quite a personal relationship with, uh, um, with the subject matter. In America, though, it was a little more, I mean, nobody says outright, I mean, but, but there's, there, there was sort of tacit or kind of, you can kind of understand that the objection is, put, is on political grounds because of the way things are phrased. I mean, I feel like these are difficult things to discuss almost, but unfortunately to write about Palestine is to be political from the off and uh, and to be seen as kind of uh, flammable or something. Um, I think that there's a degree to which when you're writing to write about before 1948, on the one hand, um, on the one hand, it's a little easier in those circumstances. On the other hand, it's also very threatening because there's, there's been this slogan that there was no such thing as Palestinians, you know, that, that it's a, in the very sort of putting forward of a Palestinian narrative is, is, uh, is, is, is worrisome for some parties. Um. Great, we have two questions left. I wonder if we can get through them very quickly, Romy. Yes, hi, hi Isabella. I was wondering what you think uh, is sort of like the most contemporary or timeless message from your book, because you know, a lot of it uh, still rings true today. Um, this reminds me of my father when he was giving me advice to be interviewed. He said, you need some sound bites. He's going to kill me for saying this. And he said, the first sound bite is you cannot oppress a people forever, <laughs> which I thought was useless. <laughs> but um, I don't think that's my, that's not my, that's not my. Is that the first working title of the book? <laughs> it's, so, it's so unhelpful. Um, but um, I, I think, um, I think it probably has something to do with the importance of family, I feel like family ends up being very important. Um, I don't know that there's a message per se, I don't feel like I'm putting across messages or trying to suggest something in particular, but um, ultimately Midhat is, becomes grounded, you know, Midhat is a soul in trouble. 
Um, and he's ultimately grounded in, in, by two things. One is that he manages to tell his story to somebody in French, which is the language in which he wants to tell the story. He can't translate himself from French to Arabic. This is, this is his problem. And he finally gets to, to narrate himself to the priest, right? And then the other thing is that his family ground him. Ultimately, they see him. He sort of has this fear of being seen, but they see him and they ground him and that somehow saves him. So I suppose those are the two, um, I don't know if that's a message exactly, but they're, they're, there's something significant in those two things. In, Timeless in things, a, yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Great, thanks Romy. Um, before I take the last question from Karam, I put two links into the chat to give us feedback and to become a supporter. Please do so if you can and help these events keep going. Um, Karam, take us away with the last question. Karama. <laughs> Karama, okay, sorry. And uh, I'm from Nablus. And my oh. question to Isabella is, um, how did you do the research? I, I lived in, Lab in, in Nablus uh, when I was a child. And, you know, a lot of the um, customs, the Nablusi customs are well uh, depicted in the book. And I was just wondering, did you live in, did you spend time there or did you talk to people who live there? How did you go about that? Yeah, I spent time there. I spent time in Nablus. And then I would go, you know, I, I, um, I lived for a year in Palestine and I um, spent a chunk of that time there. Um, mm. And, you know, talked to people, hung out, spoke to how, the elderly. How much time experience. did you spend? Um, I mean, well, I was there for a year. So and then I spent a kind oh. of chunk there. And then I would go, you know, yeah, it was like a... Um, and um, yeah, I mean, bits and pieces, history books, talking to elderly people. Oh, it's really a masterpiece, very well written. Uh, I think it's good for all times, all ages, all cultures. It's, it, it, I did not feel that only people who come from our Arabic or Palestinian culture will understand it or uh, identify with it. It's, it really resonates on so many levels. Very good job, thank you. <laughs> okay, Isabel, I'm gonna ask you one final question that Lema, who had to drop off the chat, uh, asked. Uh, and Lema is a student at the American School of uh, Ramallah and she just gave a presentation last Saturday. And so I feel like I have to honor her question. Um, her question was, what age group do you recommend uh, this for? Wow. So she is, I think she's 14 years old. Um, at what age would you pass this on to a cousin and say, hey, I think you could read this? Wow, that's a hard question. I don't know. May, I, I would say you could, do, you could read it as a teenager, right? What do you think? Maybe I'm not the right person to ask. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah. I could, you I'd could say, read it at 15. Yeah, 14, 15. Yeah. An ambitious 14 year old. Yeah, maybe. It's a lot of work. It's long, right? You have to have stamina. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, this was absolutely wonderful. Um, I, I measure success by the number of questions in the chat. So this was a hugely successful um, event. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective. Um, really, really wonderful. Thanks so much for coming on the series. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for coming. Okay, everybody, um, I will stick around for a few minutes. If anyone has any questions, again, please uh, fill out that feedback form. And if you're interested in becoming one of our supporters, uh, please do so. And uh, we have an event on Saturday. So see you there, I hope. So if anyone has any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit. Um, I'll let you unmute yourself. So just feel free. Isabella, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, guys. And good luck with the last chapter. Thank you. <laughs>